go. So welcome to today's session on teaching high school maths for the Sharp ELW535. It's going to be quite a journey. Um, so what I've tried to do is start with your basics, so your grade eight and nine level sort of work, even some grade seven work, and then moved across to your grade 10, 11, and 12 work when we look at statistics, probability, trigonometry, et cetera. The graphs, I did do a straight line graph, which is grade nine, but you can apply everything in the graphs to all of the other work, or to all of the other graphs um, in grade 10, 11, and 12. It's just a basic introduction. Hi, Valerie from Coltonville and Mohubi from Limpopo. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. So this is the calculator that we're going to look at today. It's a W535SA. It has 422 functions. Uh, so it's, it's got a lot of functions. We're not going to cover all of them today. I do want to show you all of the fun stuff and the stuff that really will help you um, in your maths classroom with making teaching maths fun and exciting for the students. Uh, there are lots of free resources that you can download. So this is the link to the simulator that I'm going to use, which is the calculator. So I will send you a PDF in the chat at the end of the workshop that you can then download. And then any of these links, you will just be able to click on and be able to go to the websites that I have um, listed here. So of course, Maths at Sharp has got your free grade 8 to 12 maths and math literacy workshops uh, worksheets. Uh, I've got some technical maths, um, and I'm hoping to start adding AP maths this year as well. We'll have to see how, how busy I get. Um, then Maths Drills is really nice if you're looking for a lot of repetitive exercises where they just, you want to ingrain something like factorizing, where you just want them to practice over and over and over again until it becomes a rote sort of exercise. Worksheetworks.com is wonderful for the junior kids. Mathswarehouse.com is an American site. It's mostly FET. You just need to sift through. Um, some of the things are labeled differently to how we teach it, uh, but the, the general maths is the same. So you just got to look for what you're looking for specifically as well. And then, of course, ATP documents. Uh, and then my personal maths blog, which is the mathsjourney.com, has got grade seven, eight, and nine worksheets available that I'm slowly building up as well in my spare time. <laughs> and then, of course, we do have support groups on Zabuza. So you need to register as a teacher on Zabuza, and then you can join the grade eight, and nine, or 10, 11, and 12 maths groups uh, and just share resources or ask for help on that group as well. We did try Telegram. Um, but there are some dodgy people on there. And unfortunately, it makes it a little bit uncomfortable. Then, of course, here is your link to the YouTube channel as well. So there are previous videos on there. Uh, right at the beginning are all the short how-to videos. So if you're doing, a, for example, statistics and you just want a quick video on how to use the calculator to just do statistics, uh, then that's quite handy as well. Right, so this is the W535. It's got lots of buttons. And uh, some of the important buttons, obviously your on button, your second function button, which activates all of your orange functions. And you'll see we'll use quite a few of them as we go through today. Then your alpha button is this greeny teal colored, and that just activates all your green or blue uh, functions on your calculator. Mode gives you four different modes, and I'll discuss that in a sec. Then you've got BS, which is backspace. Uh, it's a wonderful button. It allows you to delete mistakes that you've made um, in your expression. Then, of course, change, and we'll go into change in a little bit, allows you to change the way that your answer looks. So answer might be in a third or a fraction, and then you can change it into a decimal or an improper fraction or a mixed fraction, depending on what you want. And then, of course, equals will give you the solution. Um, not to any of your other problems, but definitely to your maths problem. So that's exciting. OK, so you've got four different modes in on your calculator. Normal does things like fractions, integers. You've got your highest common factor, lowest common multiple, which I'll go through with you. Then we've got stats. And I'm going to do both single data statistics and linear regression for any of the matrix teachers that are here today. Then table is my paper rep. It's got the best, it's got so many nice ways that you can teach um, graphs and teach finance. And I'll even show you a really nice way 
for specific solutions on uh, trigonometry equations, which is really awesome. And then of course, drill mode. Now I didn't actually add it into the presentation, but I do just briefly want to show you because it's really nice for your grade eights and nines. So you would just press math uh, mode and then three for drill. Uh, for your eights and nines, I would use mostly math. And then you can choose the type of questions you want to do. So plus minus times five. And of course, for eights and nines, I would recommend that they are able to switch between the various different calculations easily. So this one is the best option. And then of course you have 25, 50 or 100 questions as well. So you can use your up and down arrow keys to select that. Then we can press equals and it gives us a question that we need to answer. So we would type in the question, press equals, and it will give us a tick and a new question. If we get the answer wrong, it's gonna mark it wrong and then repeat the question over again. And it will keep asking us until we get the question right. Now, obviously you don't want your student to spend too much time just guessing the answer. So you can also ask the calculator for the answer by just pressing, by leaving the space blank and then pressing equals. And then it will show you what the solution is. Okay, I'm just gonna skip through questions. So I'm not getting any marks for this, as you can see, and just show you the end. That was at 12 and equals. And then you get a press enter, which is your equals button. And that gives you two marks out of 25 or 8%. So that's just the drill mode in brief, which is pretty cool. Now, the really handy thing, and um, this is for all teachers, you can share this with any of the teachers in your school because it works across the board. It's just a, a formula and you can do it on a basic calculator as well. Uh, so let's say, for example, no worries, Charles, thanks for joining us. Um, say, for example, you set a test, which is out of 70, and you want to convert all of your marks to something out of 100. So at the top, you put what you want to convert to, which would be your total percentage. At the bottom is the total that your test is out of. Then we say times, and we put in your first student's mark. Let's say they got 40 out of 70. Then we would say equals, and we get 57 and 1 7. And we can change that, and it gives us a fraction. Oh, sorry, a decimal of 57,14 or 57%. Now, for your next student's mark, all you're going to do is type in their mark, nothing else. Just type in their mark and press equals. And what happens is this K is actually saved as a value of 100 over 70. And the calculator automatically multiplies it for you. So now you get 78,57 or 79%. And you can just type in all of your class marks just like that, and easily and quickly get all of your marks done for you um, without having to spend too much time with Excel being into you, especially if you don't like Excel, this is a really handy um, calculation. Okay. Cool. So all of these steps um, and the presentation, I will send to you in the chat function at the end and also make a PDF available to you to download um, on Monday when I send out the various links as well. So let's talk through prime factors. So let's say, for example, we want the prime factor of 87. So we would type in 87, press equals, and then we would say second function and p facts. You will see it says exp, and in RN it says p facts, and that will break it down into your prime factor. Now that's pretty straightforward. We've all seen this, it's been around for a couple of years. But what we've also added is a highest common factor and a lowest common multiple uh, check. So if, for example, you want to check where, what the highest common factor of 36 and 42 is, you would type in 36, press second function and two, and we'll say GCD, but it means greatest common divisor, which is the same as highest common factor. Then we would say 42, and equals, and we get six. Okay, now we can do this with as many numbers as we like, right? Uh, you can just keep adding numbers, um, as many as you want to. Uh, obviously, I mean, you don't need more than, than four or five, but you really have the opportunity to go as many as you would like to see. 
You can also do the lowest common multiple as well. So that would be second function M3 for LCM. And we can just use the same numbers again, which would be 42. And then of course, we can add as many numbers as we want to this calculation as well. So it's a really nice way uh, to teach, for example, when we're doing fractions and we talk about the lowest common denominator. This is exactly the same functionality. So if 36, 42, and 54, and uh, 66 are all my denominators, then my common denominator would be 8,360. Then I can say 8,360 divided by 36 will tell me what I need to multiply my top value with. Okay, obviously we won't get numbers, so it's so big, but it is nice to know that you can do it uh, with any values as well. Then the other thing that I do want to just point out to you is the integer function. And, and that it's just slightly different in the fact that you cannot put uh, two negatives in a row like that, two minus signs. You need to use your negative button. And the reason for that is because this minus is a function, whereas this negative is a value. So it just changes the value of the number, whereas the minus is asking to subtract and it just uh, differentiate. So you'll see if I do it like this, it just give me an error because it assumes that you've typed it in an error. So you need to be a little bit more purposeful with your negative signs. Okay, let's talk fractions. So let's say, for example, you want to add uh, four fifths and two ninths. Okay, so there's two ways to do this. The first is to do it the, the shortcut way, which is to type in your numerator first, press your fraction button, type in your denominator, and then press your right arrow key. You can also first type in or press the fraction button, then type in your numerator, and then press down and type in your denominator. So there's slightly more button presses, but it's really a preference thing, and it's up to you how you do it. Then, of course, you can get your answer, and we can change it into those three formats. Now I'm gonna digress a little bit, it is a little bit later, but I wanna show you the recurring function. So you need to turn it on by pressing setup and then choosing number five for recurring decimal and then pressing one for on. Now, when I change everything, you can see I've actually got a recurring decimal as well as my normal decimal function as well. So it's, it's quite a nice, it's just, it's just a nice added extra, especially when we go through recurring decimals in grade eight and nine as well. If we want to add mixed number fractions, so say for example, we have uh, three and a half plus one and three quarters, we can do it in two ways. So the first way is to type your whole number in first, press second function and your fraction button to glue the fraction to the whole number, and then press a half, type in your fraction. The second option is to press your fraction button first and then to move your cursor in front of the fraction, type in your whole number and then move it back and do your uh, fraction part, your numerator and denominator and then press equals. So you'll see other calculators would multiply that one with the fraction. In this case, the sharp actually adds it as a whole number to your fraction. For you, which is, it assumes that that's what you want to do. Okay, so that's just the difference there as well. Uh, percentages. So this is particularly nice for the, the eights and nines, as well as if you are teaching any math law students. So we can find 15% of 120 by saying times 15, and then second function one, and that will give me 18. Okay, we can also say I want to add 15% to 120. We're saying 120 plus 15 and then second function one. And then the calculator automatically does that calculation for you. You can subtract 15% uh, as well if you wanted to, like that. So if you're giving a discount. Now, please note, this is not how we find VAT. If we want to find the value before VAT was added, we would need to say 120 divided by 115%. And that will give us 104 rand and 
35 cents. Now, if I test this, 104 and 35 cents plus 15 percent, it should take me back to 120 rand. You can see that that's not going to round up to a whole number, so or to a cent. So that is correct as well. All right, great. Um, any questions here? We're all still good. Fantastic, okay. Uh, so the other thing that I wanna show you and I often get asked is, can I change the way my answers are displayed? So I don't want it to show up as a fraction first, I want it to show up as a decimal first, particularly for the MATLAB students or those doing accounting where they're working with decimal answers, you want to just get a decimal answer straight away, right? So what we can do is press setup and you choose two for editor. And then you choose, uh, so line is just the old way of using scientific calculators where you wrote everything in a straight line. It didn't write it like you would write it in a textbook. Okay. We're going to use right view, but we're going to choose approximate, which is one. So your exact is the way that your calculator comes set up, and it will give you your answers inserted in fraction format with the pi, uh, where you can see the pi value or the pi written in your answer. Whereas approximate, if you did any calculation, would just give you the decimal rotation first. And then if you changed it, sorry, I should have done a, a decimal. Uh, then you can change it into a fraction as well. But it will first give you a decimal answer. And then if you change it, it will give you a fraction. Awesome, we're all happy so far. I know this is not the section where we ask questions, <laughs> but good. Okay, so let me show you a really nice uh, trick for fact wrapping. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna find factor pairs of a number. I'm just gonna move my calculator across and share the screen with you so that you can see the steps. So there we go. Okay, so. If I want to find the factor pairs of 36, I need to use my wonderful table mode. So I'm going to press mode and then two for table. Now, what we can do then is type in the number we want factor pairs of. So in this case, I'm going to use 36 as my example. Press my fraction button. And then to make an X, we press the RCL button twice. You can also press alpha RCL if you prefer. Um, but um, I'm lazy, so I like to just press the RCL. You don't need to press the right arrow. I'm just moving it so that you can see what it looks like when you have finished typing it in. Okay, then we press equals. We're going to ignore function two for now. We'll come back to that a little bit later when we do finance and stuff. Leave your start and step at zero and one. And here are all of our factor bits. Now, anything divided by zero is undefined, which is where we get this little stripy line from. Okay, so we can then scroll through the table and we get one and 36, two and 18, three and 12, four and nine, five and 7.2. So we can see five is not a factor because its um, answer is a decimal. So we ignore that one, it doesn't count, and we move on to the next one. And here we've got six and six. So we can see that we've got all of our factors because now they loop back and we are all done. Now, what's really nice about the calculator is it really goes on for as long as you like. So you could really go back and check if you wanted to, whether we had every single factor. What's also nice is even though we started at zero, you can go back up into the negative side as well. So you can go look at negative times a negative is still a positive. Uh, so that's also a really nice function. Now, we can use this functionality to teach factorizing and to help our students with factorizing. Now, I've chosen a really um, basic example here with the six, just because it, it's nice to be able to work with smaller numbers as well. I do have a workshop on our YouTube channel, which is just on factorizing. So highest compactors, uh, cubic equations, factorizing with where A is not one, all of those things. And we go into quite a lot of depth and do some um, advanced examples. So if you're looking for more help with factorizing, that's a really nice workshop to take a look at. Um, I'm also happy to send you the notes. <laughs> just You just need to email me and ask me for it. 
Okay, so here's our question. So we're going to use the six and look for facts based on six. I'm not going to do it on the calculator um, because it's quite straightforward. We've got one and six, two and three, three and two, and six and one. Okay. When we have the sign at the back as a plus, we know that the signs in our brackets are the same. So I can just write them down. And the sign that we used is the sign in front of our B value. So it's just going to be plus. Okay. Now we can then, because it says plus at the back, we can add our two columns to find our middle value. So we're going to say one plus six gives me seven, not one I'm looking for. Uh, two plus three gives me five. Yes, that is my middle value. So I can just type in a two and, or write in a two and write in a three and I'm all done. Again, the sign at the back is plus. So the signs in my brackets are the same, but this time they are both minuses. So I'm just going to write them down. And this time both of our columns will be minus columns, right? So we'll have minus one minus six gives me minus seven, not what I'm looking for. Minus two minus three gives me minus five. So yes, that is what I'm looking for. So I can just put my two and my three in again. The last one is the complicated one where you have a minus sign because a minus sign at the back means that my signs are different. So when I have something like that, I choose to make one column a minus and one column a plus. So then we would say minus one plus six gives me plus five, not what I'm looking for. Minus two plus three gives me plus one, still not what I'm looking for. Minus three plus two gives me minus one. Yes, that is what I'm looking for. So I can write down minus three and plus two and I'm all done. So it's a really nice way to do factorizing and, and just bring it down to the basics of what you're actually doing when you're factorizing and multiplying out. Awesome. Um, any questions there? So moving on from factorizing is of course the quadratic formula. And this is for your grade 11 students or any AP math students. So I'm just going to press home and home just takes me from whatever previous mode I was in directly to normal mode. So instead of having to press mode and then choose zero for normal, I can just press home instead. So it's just a, a nice little shortcut uh, for you. Okay, so what we do is we use our memory keys uh, and we save values into A, B and C. So I just want to move this so you can see my formula. There you go. So our, our equation is 3x squared minus 51x plus 17 is equal to 0. And we're looking for the value of x, right? So we would save into our a value 3. So we're going to say 3, store it in a. Then for b, we've got negative 51. So remember to use your negative sign, 51 it into our B memory key. You can see all of the memory keys are here, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then you've got X and Y, and of course, your marvelous M as well. And then lastly, we've got 17, and we store that into C. There we go. So that's the beginning. Now what we do is we type in our actual expression over here. So we're going to use, oopsie, the... I'm being silly, sorry. We're going to use the B's uh, memory keys in our um, expression here. So we're going to say negative, and then to make a B, we're going to say alpha and B. Now we don't have a plus or minus button, so I'm just going to use plus here and square root. Then we've got alpha and B, and we square that minus four alpha a alpha c over 2 alpha a, right? So there is our expression, just like it is there. And then we can say equals, and we get 16.65. Now, if you want to find the other value, instead of having to retype this whole thing, press your left arrow key, then press second function and your left arrow key. And what that does is it takes your cursor to the front of your expression so that you can get to the plus quicker. Then we'll press our 
beautiful BS button and type in a minus instead and say equals, and that gives us 0, 0,34. Now, what's really great here is that you can save other values into your A, B, and C value and scroll back up to go to that expression, right? So let's say my A is now 5, so I store that in A. My B is now 12, store that in B. And my C value is negative 21, and we'll store that in C. Then I can just scroll back up until I find my expression, press equals again, and you'll see it now gives you a different value. And of course, we can go back and change the sign and get our other A. So it's a very quick, nice way to be able to do uh, factorizing with the quadratic formula. All right, cool. Any questions here? We're all happy. All the steps are here for you. I know I did it quite quickly, uh, but it's a really nice uh, method. Okay, let's talk exponent suits and logs. So there's a really nice method that you can use to teach exponents to your students. And we use that, or we use the calculator to prove the rule. Okay, so I do actually have an investigation for grade seven, eight, and nine students on MathFitchart that you can download. If you can't find it, just email me and I'll send it directly to you, where we explore the rules of exponents, for example. When you multiply exponents and you have the same base, what happens? Okay, so let's do this. So we have two to the power of three times two to the power of four gives us 128. And if I find the prime factors of 128, it's gonna give me two to the power of seven. So how did we get to seven? We added them, right? We added the exponents. So we can check that three plus four in my exponent should give me 128, and if I prime factorize that, again, we can see the two to the power of seven. So there's a whole ex investigation on exponents here. And I think it's a second term investigation. I'm not 100% sure um, that you can then go and do with your students and they can explore using the calculator um, why this rule works. And you can do it for all of the rules, whether it's division, um, where, you, where you're dividing your exponents, um, or doing the roots and all of that fun stuff as well. Then of course, we can also do the same thing for suits. So if I have the square root of two and I multiply it by the square root of three, then we have, why is that being, that's not making, oh, that's why my setup. <laughs> Let me change my view back to the way it was, okay. Now this will make more sense. Here we go. Um, confusion means. And you'll see square root six. Okay. And we can do the same thing where we can say two times three inside our square root, and it would still give us square root of six. So the rule with thirds is when I multiply, I can multiply the inside of the square root or the values inside the square root, and I still have my square root on the outside. So they've just started sharing a house. Then, of course, from thirds, we can also move on to logs. Now, I know we don't go into depth with logs um, for caps, but just to show you briefly, quickly, uh, because you do need to know how to type it into the calculator, so that's an important thing. This log over here gives you a log with base 10. Okay, so it doesn't actually show you the 10, uh, but it is base 10. If you want a log with a different base, you would need to press second function and your pi button, and that will give you a log with a base two, or whatever, you can type it in, base three, whatever makes you happy. And then you can just type in a number, and it should give you your answer as well. So that's how the logs work. Okay, um, any questions here? We're all happy. Awesome, fantastic. Okay, great, so let's talk trigonometry then. So I wanna show you a couple of shortcuts uh, for basic trig, and then we'll move on to more complex trig at the end. So the first thing that I wanna show you is you have a sine, cos, and tan keys, and you have this orange inverse uh, cos, sine, cos, and tan. Now, if you are teaching it at the beginning, you can actually save into your D1 key the inverse of 
fine. Or in fact, your D1 keys, you can save any function into them that require two or more button presses. Um, so it's a really nice handy thing to have. Now, when you press your D1 key, you have your inverse of sign. And you can just save any functions on the calculator that are already there. So it's not programmable, um, it's just a shortcut. And then of course we can put in our ratio and it should give us our angle. And um, what I do wanna say here is, uh, so when you're using these, these are finding your ratios and when you save it into your D keys, these are using your finding your angles. So we say D is for degrees, and it's a nice memory um, mnemonic for, for students who are starting out with trigonometry and they're struggling a little bit um, with remembering which one to use to find what. Okay. The other uh, nice shortcut that I want to show you is where you have a point on your Cartesian plane. So let's say we have a point P pardon my very skewed hypotenuse. <laughs> so let's say we have five and 12, and we need to find our R value. Okay. So what we can then do is we type in our X first, press our X comma Y button, type in our 12, and then say second function, and we press eight. You'll see above eight, it says arrow R theta. And what it's doing is it's converting your rectangular coordinates into polar coordinates, and your polar coordinates is your hypotenuse, and the angle your hypotenuse makes with your x-axis over here, so that's theta. And of course, you can also reverse this. So you can actually type in your hypotenuse and your angle. I forgot what the angle is, so I'm just going to make something up, right? And then say second function and nine, and it will give us x is 6.5 and y is 11.5. Too far. So your height is 11.25 and your distance is six and a half. So it's a really nice function. Now, what's cool is, and I didn't show this yesterday and I should have, is if you go to your memory bank and you go and check what values are in your calculator, you can see that the x value and y value of the coordinate k has now been saved into your x and y memory keys. So if you wanted to use them in a calculation, you would just have to pull up your X memory key or your Y memory key instead of having to type in the full uh, number for you instead. Okay. Awesome. So from here, we can then look at the cast diagram. And a lot of students, we, we just say, okay, this is the cast diagram and we don't explain why it works. And it, it really gives them Based of a grounding, we need to show them why the cast diagram works like it does. So I want to show you um, a really nice exercise that you can do with them on the calculator. So for this, what we're going to do is we're going to go to our table mode, and we're just going to type in a sine graph. I'll just start with sine, and then we'll go through it in a minute. Okay, so I've got sine x, x is my angle equals leave function two for now. My step, I'm going to make 15 instead of one because one will take us a very long time to find any pattern. So let's just jump it a little bit faster. And let's start at negative 180. Okay, so at negative 180 or between negative 180 and uh, negative 90, all of my values are negative between negative 90 and zero, all of my values are still negative. But from zero to 90, all of my values are positive. And from 90 to 180, all of my values are positive. So if we go to a table and we fill in those signs, and you can see that I've pulled them from here. So what negative, negative, positive, positive, negative, negative. What it does is it says that my quadrants uh, sign is negative uh, here, right? It's positive here, so I'm going to put a little sign there. Uh, it's positive in this quadrant, and it's negative in these two. Then I can do the same thing for cos, right? right? I can say um, cos is positive in this one. It's, uh, no, it's negative. And so on. And eventually what you'll do is you'll be able to see that only T is positive here. They're all positive here. T. 
and only cos is positive here. So we call this one all, and then we have our cost diagram. And they can see from the table why this happens. And they can scroll through the table on the calculator because your table is unlimited. You can go for as long as you like, and you're not going to run out of space. So you can watch that pattern repeat itself over and over and over again if, for every 360 degrees. And so you can really give them an idea of where our K, when we multiply with K360 uh, for our specific and general solutions, this is actually where it comes from because the graph repeats itself every 360 degrees, obviously depending on um, what you change in the graph. But yes. Okay, whether you double your angle and so on. So I'm not going to go through these tips. Uh, they're pretty straightforward. What I do want to do is actually solve um, a specific solution with you. So obviously the first step is to find our general solution, which we do by dividing this whole thing by three, so that we've got sine x plus 30 is equal to one third. Then we find our angle by saying second function sine or pressing the D1 key because we stayed there. And we get a reference angle of 19,47 degrees. From there, we've got x plus 30. Because x plus 30 was in brackets, you cannot take the 30 over before you found your reference angle. Okay. So sine, we know from our cost diagram, is positive in this quadrant and positive in that quadrant. So we are two specific solutions must have a normal one where we just have 19.47 and we take the 30 to the other side plus k360 because it repeats itself every 360 degrees and we also have sine is positive here where we have 180 minus our reference angle and then of course minus the 30 degrees that originally came from x plus k360 so here are our two general solutions okay now if we are looking for a specific solution what we're going to do is we're going to take our calculator and go to table mode. And in table mode, in function one, let me just do this so you can see my um, equation <laughs> brain. Um, so we're going to type this first equation in here, this 10.5, blah, blah, blah. So we're going to have negative 10.53 plus, obviously, we don't have a K. We use an X instead times 360 equals. And then for our second one, we have 130 degrees, 0.53 plus K. Again, we use our X times 360. Now, we're looking for answers between 30 degrees and 200 degrees. And what the calculator is doing is we're substituting K values. So of course, your step must be one into our calculation here. So if k is zero, this is our solution here. It's negative 10.53 or it's 130.53, <clears throat> sorry. So <clears throat> you can see here, if we go to negative one, we can see immediately that it doesn't fall into our um, set of solutions that we're looking for. So we can ignore that. We can see that negative 10 also doesn't fit, but 130.53, does fit. And then of course, when K is one, we can see it's already too high. So we've immediately found, <coughs> sorry, all of our specific solutions without struggling to substitute in all of those K values, which makes it um, a little bit easier for, for the students, uh, which is quite nice as well. Okay, uh, any questions with trigonometry? We're all still happy. Okay, uh, fantastic, great. Just jump in there in the chat if you have any questions. Okay, so teaching graphs. Um, I started with a very basic graph where I said y is equal to x. I typed that into the calculator. So I'm not going to do it because you sort of have an idea of what's going on. And you can see that when x is 0, y is 0. When x is 1, y is 1, and so on and so forth. Now we can plot that onto a graph, which I'll show you in a minute. Then I said, what happens if x is multiplied by two. So I left function one as x, and in function two, I said two times x. And then I went through and I looked at the graph. And we can see that all of our points have doubled. So from here, it was just zero, one, two. Uh, but in two x, we have 
0, 2, 4, because we are multiplying each x by 2. So what happens if we multiply by negative 2? So in function 2, I deleted the 2x, and I now added minus 2x, and I looked at what happened. So we can see that it is a negative double of the original x value. So what have we learned? Well, we can see that our original graph is the black one here, which is y is equal to x. And you can see it's uh, 1 and 1. So our gradient is 1. And our um, angle here, you can see it's a 45 degree angle. Then this g graph here is for y is equal to 2x. And you can see that it's basically doubled. So our gradient is now steeper than it was uh, with the original graph. With this graph here, we've got y is equal to negative 2x. So we can see that it's actually mirror image of the red graph here, which was 2x. So we can see that when we have a negative gradient, our graph changes direction. Okay, so instead of going from negative to positive, it goes from positive to negative, or it has a downward slope. Okay, so that's just a general idea for graphs for teaching um, gradients. And we can do the same thing where we talk about shifting the graph, to, uh, shifting the graph up or down, right? And we, we can do it here and I'll show you. So we'd have x plus one, then we did x minus one and we drew the graph. So here's my original y is equal to x graph. Here is y is equal to x plus one. And we can see it's just shifted the entire graph up by exactly one at every single point. Here we've got y is equal to x minus 1. We can see the entire graph has been shifted down by one value. So they're all parallel because the gradients are exactly the same, but we've only moved where they intersect um, on the y-axis. So the, the value 1 and minus 1 gives us our y-intercept on our Cartesian plane. So this is just a very basic look into graphs. You can do much more in depth um, where you actually explore this. And I've done it in our grade 10 study guide where they spend some time on the calculator drawing the graphs where we shift the hyperbola and a parabola and, and all of those sorts of things. It's a lot of fun. It makes a lot more sense for students. Um, once they start seeing why everything is shifting, then they understand what a particular um, variable in a formula does. Okay, happy with graphs? Good, 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 awesome. Okay, so let's talk probability here. Um, so we've got a really nice function on the calculator, which is your random function, and it's got four different options. So you've got random, which does uh, random decimals between zero and one to three decimal places. So for your grade seven and eight, if you want to do practice rounding or four for your math lit guys in grade 10, you can just generate random numbers between zero and one and ask them to round off to two decimal places and one decimal place. Then you've got the dice and we can just press one for dice and then to roll the dice. Uh, so exactly like a dice, you have numbers between one and six. Then we've also got the coin, which is a math coin. So instead of heads and tails, it's going to give us zeros and ones. And it's the same probability. It's a 50% probability of whether you get a zero or whether you get a one. Then you've got random integers. Okay, and this is a really nice one. So what I like to do with students is play the lottery with them and as an introduction to probability. So I ask them all to write their six lottery numbers between one and 52 onto a piece of paper. Once they've chosen the numbers, I then ask them to switch with the person sitting next to them. This lowers cheating. Uh, <laughs> and then what we do is we generate the random numbers on the calculator. So we'll have the first number is 46, the second number is 51, and so on and so forth. Um, for the six numbers. So you can write them down on the board or whatever makes you happy. And you can see the students get quite excited um, to see whether or not they win the lottery. So another nice game that you can play with them is with the dice, where you get them all to stand up and ask them to choose numbers between one and six. 
and then you roll the dice on your simulator or on your calculator. If the number that you've rolled is the same as the number that the student has, they can stay standing. If it's not, they need to sit down. And then you do two or three rounds and you can see it will, it will um, go quite quickly where the students sit down. And you can do the same thing with your dice, uh, sorry, with your coin, where you ask them to choose either a zero or a one. Okay, so then again, it will take a lot longer because now the chances of getting it right is 50%, whereas with the dice, it's only actually uh, approximately 16%, one out of six. And then you can lead into your discussion on probability by asking them, okay, so why does it take longer to win the dice game than it does to with the coin game? And you can lead into a discussion about tree diagrams and about multiplying along branches and adding your probabilities down the branches and all of that sort of stuff. So it's a really nice introduction uh, to probability with your students as well. Now, there were quite a few requests um, for permutations and combinations, as well as for Euclidean geometry. Um, so let me, thanks, Nachta and, and Mabizela, I appreciate the feedback. Um, so I do want to do permutations and combinations with you, but for Euclidean geometry, we have an amazing workshop with the author Kevin Smith of the Handbook and Study Guide that is on the YouTube channel. Um, which you can watch. He covers all of the grade 11 trigonometry and theory, and it's a very, very helpful video. I am going to try and organize another one with him this year, um, but if I don't, I will find someone who does um, wonderful geometry and, and do a workshop with you guys on geometry, because I, I believe it's quite a stress. <laughs> okay, so let's talk probability. So when you grab a handful of sweets out of a bag and you look at them, that's a combination. So you, it doesn't matter in what order you eat the sweets, they're all gonna taste the same, or slightly variations of the same, um, but it doesn't matter. So your order doesn't matter. However, when you have a permutation, your order does matter. So this is where you have first, second, and third place, and you have four different students who can then fit into first, second, and third place. So when you rearrange the colors, you now have, instead of one option, you now have three different options or six different options. Um, so you have a lot more options available to you with a permutation because of the way that you organize the things that you've pulled out of your bag. Okay. So let's quickly do a permutation on the calculator and a combination. So say, for example, you have four students and you want to place them in first, second, and third place and how many different possible combinations you have. So you have three places for them to fit into. And then we can say equals and we get 24 different ways that you can select from four students for first, second, and third position. But if you have four students and you are just sending them to the principal's office, it doesn't matter in which order you send them. Well, hopefully not. Uh, so we can just send three places and the answer is four different ways that you can send the student to the office because you have four options, basically. Okay, so I hope that that makes more sense for you. Awesome. Let's talk finance. So, I want to go through this with you. If you've seen it before, please forgive me. <laughs> but it is, it's a really nice way to teach uh, simple and compound entries. So, again, we're going to use our marvelous table mode. And I'm going to start with my simple interest. So, I'm going to invest a thousand Rand at an interest rate of 5% per year. And I'm going to ask how many years, and I'm going to see what happens. So, my X is my number of years position. And I'm going to go and look at my table. So we initially had a thousand rand. After one year, we had a thousand and fifty rand. After two years, we had one thousand one hundred rand. After three years, one thousand one hundred and fifty rand. So we can see that as we progress, we are just adding fifty rand to our total every time. Okay. So with simple interest, we are adding five percent every year of the initial investment. Now with compound interest, so I'm going to leave function one here, and in function two, I'm going to type in a compound interest formula, right? 
I'll have one plus using exactly the same values, but I'm going to use my compound formula instead of my uh, simple interest formula, like so. And I'm going to say equals, equals, equals. Now we can see that we got the same amount back after year one. But after year two, I've earned an extra 2 rand 50 in my compound interest account than I did in my simple interest account. And we can see that as we go, the longer that our compound interest fits, the more money we're getting. And that's because we're taking 5% of the previous year's amount and not 5% of the initial amount. So that's the difference. Now, there's some really nice things that we can do here. So for example, we could ask, when does your compound interest and your simple interest double? And we can see that at 15 years, our compound interest has doubled, but it took 20 years to double our simple interest. And you can see that there's quite a substantial difference between the two by the time that we reach 20 years. I mean, you've got an extra 650 rand. That's a, a, like almost a third of what you, in fact, 100% increase on top of the simple interest, almost 100%. Now you can also use this to teach decay, which is just a matter of uh, using subtract instead of cut. So let's just go back and edit that. And now you can see that my decay is the same. So when you use compound decay, it decays slower than when you're using simple decay. And you can see, okay, after um, 20 years, I have a zero value for my decay in simple interest. But after 20 years in my compound interest, my value is still 358. Okay, and it will take a lot longer to reach that value where it becomes a zero. And in fact, it should never reach zero. It should just keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so that's simple and compound decay. Now, the other thing that I want to show you with finance is present values. And there's a really nice way uh, to talk through and work with a present value annuity using your table mode. So what I'm going to do is, um, let me show you the whole screen so that you can follow with me. So this is the present value annuity. And what I've done is instead of putting in a monthly repayment, I want to work out what I can borrow based on my monthly repayment. So I'm going to use X for my monthly repayments. And then the rest, I'm going to just type in here. My interest rates, I'm going to say is 10% um, per year compounded monthly, which is at 12. To, and then I'm going to borrow it over a period of five years and I'm going to pay it back monthly, which is where that's what comes from. And close. And again, we just do an interest of 10 over 100 times 12. Okay. So that's a very big present value annuity. I know I've typed it in really fast here, um, but you can go through the steps slowly with the notes and try it out and see, or pause the video if you're watching on YouTube, then delete your function too by just pressing on to clear it. And then we say equals. Again, let's just leave start and step. I'll come back to that in a minute. So essentially what this table is telling me is that if I'm willing to pay back one rand a month for five years, I can borrow 47 rand right now. If I'm willing to pay back two rand, I can borrow 94 rand. Now, this is not really very helpful with us because it's going to take us a long time to get to a point where we can actually get a, a usable value. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my step to 100. So now I'm counting in uh, values of 100. So we can see if I'm willing to pay back 100 rand a month over five years, I can borrow 4,700 rand. If I'm willing to pay back 500 Rand a month, I can borrow 23,500 Rand. If I'm willing to pay back 1,000 Rand, I can now borrow 47,000 Rand um, and so on. So if I wanted to buy a car that was worth 100,000 Rand, I can go look in my table for where this is 100,000. So it's between 2,100 and 2,200 Rand that I would need to be able to pay back every month 
in order to afford a car that is 100,000 Rand based on paying it back over five years at a 10% interest rate. Now you can of course tweak this formula. So if you know that you're gonna get a load which is over six years um, with an interest rate of 9%, you can go back and then edit everything. So uh, let's just change that to six and that to nine. like so, and we can just go through again. And now you can see that your values will change. So if I wanted a loan for 100,000 Rand over six years, um, we can see that we're gonna pay approximately 1,800 Rand um, per month instead of 2,100 Rand. So it makes a substantial difference, the interest rates, and obviously the number of repayments that you're doing. And there's lots of ways to fiddle with your present value formula and the table mode and find different answers um, to various questions that you've got, which is quite handy. Cool. Everyone happy so far? We're all still good, alive, well, not asleep yet. Okay, fantastic. Let's do statistics mode. So, um, uh, I have shared the wrong screen. Um, there we go, that's what I want. So let's uh, do basic stuff and then I'll do linear regression with you as well. So we're gonna press mode and then one for stat and we're gonna choose zero for single data. Okay. Um, and then what you can do is just type in all your X values. So 43 equals, this is the data I'm putting in here. Uh, 59, 84, 72, 61, 30, and 93. Okay, so we've got seven different values. Now, of course, we can either press on or change, but the change just alternates between our table of values and our calculation screen. So if we wanna go back and check something, so for example, that 30 should have actually been a 50. What we do is just make sure we're highlighting the 30, type 50 over it, and press equals, and we get, uh, it's now changed on our table there as 50. Okay, so simple as that, it's really easy. Then we wanna find our statistics values. So to do that, we press alpha and eight, and you can see our first thing on the menu is statistics values. So we press zero, and then that gives us a summary of every statistic that we would need. Um, for high school maths. So you've got your average is 66, your standard deviation. So in high school, we use our population formula, which is the sigma x. So it's this one here. We've got our sum of x over there. We've got our minimum, quartile one, median, quartile three, and maximum. So it's just a matter of scrolling through your pages to find the thing that you need. If you want to, for example, do the standard deviation, one standard deviation from the mean, what you could then do is say alpha eight and choose two variables, select your mean or your average, which is one, say minus alpha eight. And again, we choose two for variable. And now we want the standard deviation, which is four. And we say equals. So one standard deviation from the mean is 49 on the lower end. And if I put in a plus, it's 82 on the at the end. So it's really nice and easy to, to work with your calculator and find those solutions. Okay, let's do linear regression as well quickly. I just wanna find the values. Okay, so what we're gonna do is press mode, then one for stat, and this time we can see our linear regression equation is a plus bx. So we can just press one. Now in your table, you have two options. You can type in all of the X values, go back, press your up arrow key, get to the top, type in all of your Y values. I feel like it sort of half misses the point with, with students because they can sometimes make a mistake. Uh, they can miss a value. Uh, so they can mismatch the coordinates. Um, it's, it's much easier to make a mistake. Whereas if you type it in as a coordinate pair, so we use this button over here, X comma Y, and press seven and say equals, then it will automatically fill the table in for us. So it's the same number of button presses 
but your level of accuracy just goes much higher. So I'm not going to do all of the values. I'm just going to do one more, uh, seven and 23. Okay. When we're done, we can press again our change value. Now with linear regression, the thing that we want is obviously our line. So we can press alpha and eight for stat. You can see that eight in blue. And here we've now got an option on one, which is regression value. So you can then press one for regression value, gives us our y-intercept, our gradients, and of course our correlation coefficient over there as well. So it's all there, very, very easy to find. Uh, your table is massive, it's got a hundred data points in it. Um, but obviously, if you're using that much data, you should be using Excel to do your, your statistics. But it is an option on the calculator if you need it for quick answers. Again, all of your statistics values are in zero. So you can press zero and you can see uh, your average standard deviation, your y values, um, minimum and maximums as well. Okay. Awesome. So that's stats. Is everyone happy with stats? All of the steps are here for you. So I'll share this um, with you at the end. Um, guys, if you have joined us on YouTube, thank you so much for your time. I hope that you found this workshop helpful and uh, we look forward to hearing your comments down below.